And a very pleasant good morning, everybody. In fact, any morning is a pleasant good morning after what I've been through over the last uh, five, six days. Uh, thanks for joining us here on NoFilter.net. Do I look uh, straighter? We talked to Leslie yesterday yes. and Joe Manuel of No Filter, and they said uh, my camera was on a tilt. Yes, yes, it was. I immediately took a level out to see if the floor, <laughs> I had moved sites and locations for the broadcast stuff. And I thought, well, maybe the floor was uh, not level, but that uh, was not the case. Uh, it managed uh, you know, to come down to uh, one little adjustment uh, on the uh, camera tripod that I use. So uh, so I, I, I'm straight front and center here because uh, the question always after you get out of the hospital for a while, and uh, we'll get into that just for a second here before we start dissecting Luby and trying to help you bury your bookmaker on uh, these AFC championship games today because it's all about making money. And you need a lot of money after uh, being hospitalized. I had a thing uh, come up that uh, knocked me out for five days, and uh, later on today, I will have my first experience ever. You talk about the geezers at Caesars of doing a show. Uh, we're going to be doing a radio show on the Tony Bruno Sports Network while taking in an IV drip. <laughs> <laughs> they said I'd be doing this to my grave, and uh, it's very possible it happens, like in the middle of a show. But, uh, yeah, I, I was diagnosed with, with a strange thing, uh, osteomyelitis. It's called. Uh, you can look that up. It's kind of gruesome uh, to uh, see the details of uh, what's involved. But uh, instead of a doctor, the first time uh, I opened my eyes while, while in the hospital, instead of a doctor coming in, they had a guy in, in uh, one of those white jackets that a butcher wears. Oh, and he had blood all over his shirt and he had a meat cleaver. Oh. <laughs> so they said, well, this guy, uh, you know, Bruno over here is option A. And option B is a, a long term of treatment uh, while uh, both in here and at home. And uh, what do you think? I took the B plan for sure. I definitely uh, opted out of plan A, but uh, good to be with you guys here on nofilter.net. And uh, Louie, thank you so much for carrying the load and uh, keeping the thing going while we were uh, uh, unfortunately uh, in a situation uh, that uh, was not necessarily favorable. Yeah. Uh, hospital is uh, no place to be. Uh, it was a fine job that the staff did. And uh, really uh, one of the most cordial staffs I've ever seen. Everybody that came in uh, the person that was cleaning the floor, I mean, they even had a very pleasant disposition. And I guess when I get the bill, well, th that's one good thing about being old. Medicare, uh, they, they send a limo for you once you tell them you have Medicare and a supplement. <laughs> so uh, that, that was uh, fortunate for me. Hey, a ton of stuff happened before we get into uh, these AFC playoff games. And uh, we do want to zero in in particular because we originate from South Florida. We want to zero in on the Miami Dolphins and the Kansas City Chiefs, which uh, is that the most interesting of the three AFC games? Not just uh, from uh, a uh, entertainment standpoint, but also from a betting standpoint, I, I think that one might be the most difficult to decipher. Although you can throw out the usual factors in that ball game, and we'll get into that. But uh, you know, I don't know that this boils down to why. Well, you know what? The Chiefs are four and five against the spread in games that played on a Tuesday night after a full moon when there was a total eclipse of the sun. I'm not sure that all of these trends apply, and. <laughs> Well, we, we have a little bit of a different direction to go in, but the weather seems to be the big factor there. Yep, yep. But last night, blockbuster stuff all day yesterday. I mean, talk about Black Monday. You had Arthur Smith uh, fired before he even got out of the locker room. His yep. car was uh, not even out of the parking lot, and he was let go by the Atlanta Falcons. <laughs> and uh, then, you know, the dominoes started to fall in other places. Mike Vrabel, I don't know if that was any surprise uh, that uh, Vrabel got canned. Uh, you were looking at Ron Rivera, and that was seemingly a foregone conclusion. I'm not sure I saw the Seattle Seahawks parting with Pete Carroll. No. Pete Carroll, uh, you know, first of all, uh, and I'm the same age as Pete Carroll and uh, Nick Saban. And uh, the Saban thing, that also caught me by yeah. a little bit of surprise. Did you see him? Uh, there was no indication that he was going to retire what at the end of the season, was there? Playoff, it, it seemed, and he was just fighting to get a top two recruiting class. So it felt like he, yeah, that he's not going to be there 10 years, but it felt like he'd be there two to three. Like he had a, a three more years in him. Still looked good. He, he still seemed to be enthusiastic. He still had the uh, uh, college football and guy Hancock. Uh, you know, he had the college football playoff committee completely uh, under his thumb. <laughs> the guy could have been six and seven, and they still would have found a way to put him into the championship game. So uh, you knew he was going to get a shot at that every year, especially with a 12 team playoff. Uh, you you would have thought a veritable cinch. But uh, everybody says, uh, and I don't know, do you find this? Uh, to have uh, more than an element of truth to it, that Nick Saban did not like the status of college football anymore. It was no longer about recruiting, which he claimed was his greatest skill. When he got the job, he told the athletic director at Alabama, well, uh, you may not have got the best coach in the world, but you got the best recruiter. 
as evidenced by the fact that uh, when he was in the movie Blindside, you had this total prick of a human being, and he was able to turn his personality into something that you actually found somewhat appealing. As he sat there with Sandra Bullock, uh, and, uh, you know, it's great that that whole story turned out to be bullshit because it yes. made me think even less of Nick Saban yes. as a human being that he would be a part of that stinking movie. That, that might have been one of the worst sports movies in the history ever made. You know that he was not a pleasant guy. But, but we always despised him here in South Florida because of his two-year tenure with the Miami Dolphins. Yep. And we tend to not look. Uh, we're overlooking uh, with Nick Saban uh, his many accomplishments, including seven national championships, 12 conference championships, including many in the SEC, 11 of those, 19 ball victories, 292 wins, an overall record as a college head coach of 292-71-1. and one. Holy Bear Bryant. Jesus. This guy was brilliant. Had uh, five SEC Coach of the Year honors, but then there it is right at the bottom of uh, his resume, 15 and 17 as a professional coach. <laughs> and it wasn't that that disturbed us about Nick Saban. It was more along the lines of uh, his performance. He, he single-handedly destroyed the culture of the Dolphins organization, which was always known and uh, had a long association with the Dolphins organization going all the way back to 1981 when it came to South Florida. And prior to that, I thought one of the classiest organizations in sports. I don't know if it's still true today. It was the Los Angeles Dodgers who I had the pleasure of covering, and they treated everybody like a champ. USC football also had that uh, same kind of feel to it, that uh, you really enjoyed going there and dealing with the people. And the Miami Dolphins, uh, from an internal office standpoint, from the executive offices all the way through the secretaries and the equipment managers, uh, they seemed to have the kind of spirit that, that would uh, lead you to the conclusion that that had a lot to do with the overall success of the franchise until Nick came along. Mm -hmm. And uh, the story goes, and uh, it's been verified uh, many, many times, that uh, some secretary uh, looked at Nick Saban. He had a henchman that used to follow him, a guy named O'Brien. He would follow him everywhere he went, uh, kind of like uh, you would have the, one of those Mounties following one of the SEC coaches with the funny hats. <laughs> And you're thinking, uh, are you going to take that guy into the locker room so he doesn't get uh, bothered by the fans? Or are you going to write me a traffic ticket? What the hell are you doing here? <laughs> and uh, a secretary says, uh, you know, hey, nice haircut, Nick. A and he turns to his henchman and says, make sure she's gone by the time I get to the office. <laughs> and they literally were like firing people for, for just uh, it, it was one of those things like Barbara Streisand, uh, a guy who owns in a hotel down here in South Florida, told me that Barbara Streisand, when she got to the front desk, I don't even know if she had to stop by there, but uh, she had informed the concierge, don't have any of the help. Look me in the eye while I'm here. And that was Nick. And, and from that point on, I mean, if you have that kind of characteristic where you can't be nice to the so-called little people that are supporting you that are not making the $20 million a year and they're out there just dedicated to doing their job. You know how it was because we were in the radio business. Yep. So, I mean, if uh, you weren't uh, the squeaky wheel, you, you definitely weren't getting the oil. And uh, in Nick's position there and uh, his uh, you know, behavior while he was uh, the head coach of the Miami Dolphins soured me on Nick Saban forever. But you can't take away that he was a great coach. Now, now the other thing that happened before we get into these playoff games, um, a couple of them, right? I, I was surprised that Pete Carroll was let go. In essence, uh, you know, it was one of those things where, uh, you know, he, he was informed that, oh, we're going in another direction. Yeah, you still want to be a part of this thing? Yeah, supposedly he actually fought, unlike Belichick, where it was parting of ways, he supposedly fought to keep his job. And they've been consistent the last few years, even though they went in total upheaval. And they're like, no, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. <laughs> you think they ever got over the Malcolm Butler interception? That, that might have been... <laughs> That might have been Pete Carroll's doom. Nobody looked better at 72 than Pete Carroll. I, you know, I'm 72 years old, and uh, you know, nobody ever had that kind of appearance on it. And he, he seemed to have plenty of energy and enthusiasm, and I thought he did a great job with a bunch of schlepper quarterbacks. I mean, he made the decision to start Ru uh, Russell Wilson, who, who uh, was an unknown commodity, a third-round draft pick out of Wisconsin where they never throw the ball. And he starts him over Matt Flynn, who they just paid $10 million because they were enamored with uh, one of those garbage-time games at the end of the season. When he threw six touchdown passes, $10 million was a lot of money. Yes, it was yes. an enormous amount of money for a quarterback or anybody else. And uh, they made that giant mistake. Uh, Pete Carroll, uh, you know, he dissuaded them from uh, using this guy as a starting quarterback, put Wilson in there, and had great success over the years. Look, Geno Smith couldn't have been uh, more than the ultimate cast-off. And uh, he had him have some very, very uh, productive seasons uh, while the quarterback for the Seattle Seahawks. So I, I thought the guy could coach, just like uh, Belichick. 
still had something left in that capacity. I, I don't know why they decided to go in another direction there, because uh, you, you would think that it would be a pleasure to play for Pete Carroll. Mm-hmm. That the uh, players would, would have rallied around him. Uh, they went nine and eight this year, not a disaster. And uh, yet, uh, you know, they, they called him into the office and gave him the old usual line that, uh, hey, Pete, <laughs> your money's no good here anymore. We'll pay you the final year of your contract and you can be a consultant. But after that, uh, we want you out of here. You're not even going to be, you know, able to get a job at the fish market there <laughs> when, when it's all said and done. So so some blockbuster stories there. But uh, what we wanted to give you our uh, astute uh, input and, and analysis. And we want to try to make you uh, some money, help yes. you bury your bookmaker. <laughs> uh, we always go by the theory uh, of my uh, grandmother and her dying words, which were always take the points. Yes. But are you inclined to do that, Mike Louie Lubitz, oh. with the Miami Dolphins going on the road? There are so many factors, uh, kind of esoteric factors, that would lead you to believe that the Kansas City Chiefs cover in this game. I- I'm going to throw out some of the conventional wisdom, too, because uh, we don't have any trends on this. Like, uh, well, you know what? The Chiefs, they are 0-2 uh, when uh, faced with a situation where they're playing a team that's coming off a loss after covering the point spread in the three previous <laughs> weeks. <laughs> on a Tuesday night game uh, when it was a full moon and, and a uh, space launch had taken place at Cape Canaveral. I don't know that any of that is applicable, uh, but a couple of things that you have to look at here and uh, take seriously into consideration. The Dolphins 0-10 in their last uh, games, uh, the last 10 games, uh, in temperatures that were 40 degrees or lower. And Tua Tangabayaloa, man, as if he was eating a dull pineapple on his way to the ballpark <laughs> and dreaming about surfing in the Hawaiian uh, waves. Uh, he... Uh, is 0-4 in, in games uh, in, in cold climates, uh, 45 degrees or less, 0-4. Now, that's a small sample size. It's kind of like the Barry Bonds thing where he was horrible in the playoffs, but he'd only been in a couple of uh, circumstances where you could apply those stats, and then he eventually broke out of it, <laughs> maybe with a needle in his arm. But uh, I, I don't know. Can, can you consider 0-4 in, in those uh, situations and the 0-10, uh, the franchise last 10 outings in cold climates? Uh, being uh, the most significant factor about trying to handicap this game? Well, that well, it makes it significant. It's not that, okay, this team can't win in the cold. It's that they don't play in the cold. It's You You actually said yeah. an interesting term. The sample size is small, right? So what does that mean? They don't do it a lot. The, whatever the Chiefs are, and look, it's not like the Chiefs' offense is built for the cold. They can run, but Mahomes hates running. Mahomes literally goes out of the run, even when Pacheco's hot, to be brutally honest. It's that the Chiefs are forced because of where they are to play in the cold like four or five times a year, whereas the Dolphins play in the cold once every decade. So, yeah. like, you're fran- as a franchise, whatever players are there, just not used to it. And that's to his thing. He's from Hawaii and played in Alabama and now plays in Miami. <laughs> like, when is he playing in the cold? So, it's, it's not, he probably could do it, but if you don't do something compared to someone that does do it a lot, and that's what it comes down to with the coaches. Reed's done it a lot, McDaniel hasn't. It's sort of scary. To, uh, on top of that, the Chiefs are nowhere near as injured as the Dolphins. The Dolphins are injured everywhere, and it's all important people, which scares the living crap out of me. Look, I, I don't believe in the Chiefs right now. I just don't see how the Dolphins can do it. Well, I realized this uh, after experiencing the Ratso Rizzo dream of moving to places that, uh, you know, I grew up in New York, went to school at Syracuse. It's fucking freezing there. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about 50 below, only Ben Schwartzwalter. <laughs> And I, you know, I remember screaming on my way to the quad uh, for the few classes that I attended during the wintertime. Uh, and uh, the general theory was find a girl at registration because you won't want to come out of hibernation <laughs> until the spring comes around. And that one day of Indian summer is experienced in Syracuse, New York, a totally different climate, very similar to what the Dolphins might experience uh, in Kansas City. But uh, yeah, I'm going where the sun keeps shining. I, I didn't realize how much it would impact you. Until uh, while calling a boxing match, uh, I had uh, gone out. I uh, used to do some TV boxing, quite a bit of it. And I remember got a call, and uh, I was doing a Virgil Hill fight in Minot, North Dakota. Oh, Jesus. I was coming out of South Florida, and uh, I was all excited about it. And I was just really launching my uh, television boxing career. And so uh, I went, I figured, okay, I'm going to dress up a little bit for this thing. <laughs> You'll find that surprising. <laughs> and I bought a new pair of pants, and they were cotton uh, slacks that I had bought, and I get off the plane in Minot, North Dakota, where it hit me. It was a negative 50 <laughs> wind chill factor, and the airport in Minot, North Dakota is one of those where I think one plane comes in every six months, oh, God. and so you have to walk to the terminal uh, from the airplane, and uh, I nearly died uh, on my way uh, to the terminal. 
and, and I realized my blood had thinned out to the point where it was very prohibitive to uh, function in any kind of a normal fashion while in these temperatures, because so while I had a high tolerance for the cold from my past, I had zero for it after a couple of years in Florida. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's factor number one. And, and then the other factor I think that you really have to look at, and, and uh, you take this uh, very seriously, the fat man versus the intellectual. Exactly. Fat man versus the intellectual. We have uh, Andy Reid, uh, known as the fat man, finally so. A lot of playoff experience, Super Bowl championships. Uh, was a dynamite coach with the Philadelphia Eagles for many years, and now at Kansas City, some would consider him. Uh, does he deserve that kind of uh, position where he's considered the top coach in the league or among the oh, top yeah, but, two or three yeah. anyway? Oh, and good. we don't know what to make of Mike McDaniel yet, do we? No. We, we often, uh, you have the biggest problem with him with his play calling and selection uh, under the auspices of uh, don't get cute. Whatever yep. you do, don't get cute. He, he seems to want to pass the ball when he should run it, and run the ball when it calls for passing situations and more of a feeling of urgency and desperation. And the December swoon of the Miami Dolphins, which is not atypical of the franchise, really came into focus uh, this past year, including the game that hurt them the most, where they lost to the Tennessee Titans while having a 14-point lead with under four minutes to go in a ball game. And uh, they let that all disappear and ended up losing the game. And that cost them the opportunity to have a home game. Yep. And sunny and balmy South Florida, as opposed to going on the road and facing these horrendous conditions. This is going to be very much like the ice ball game, I think, uh, in uh, the case of Dallas and Green Bay, 1967, 16 years old. And my favorite aspect among the many of that particular historic ball game was that the Wisconsin lacrosse marching band was supposed to play before the game and at halftime. But they had to scratch all of that because seven of the tuba players had their instruments freeze to their oh, lips and had to be taken to the hospital <laughs> where immediate surgery was being done. And believe me, a hospital is no place to be having just spent the last five days at a, a local hospital here where uh, I probably had more needles jabbed in my arm than Kurt Cobain did in his oh. entire musical career. Oh, you were just hoping that somebody would bring a similar substance so you could feel better about the situation that you were in. But four and a half points, Kansas City Chiefs, favorite of the Miami Dolphins. That line has slid up just a little bit. Mm. I think you always go with the fat man. And uh, there's evidence uh, to support my theory. You may think, hey, what, what is this guy talking about? What kind of handicapping is that? <laughs> it's the absolute fundamental truth. It's the empirical truth, people. You look at coaches like Rex Ryan, right? What happened to him? Did he have the bariatric surgery, uh, Rex Ryan? Because yes. he, he lost a ton of weight at one point. He had one of those. Yeah, he had one of those surgeries. Lap band surgery uh, while he was doing all kinds of funky things, uh, you know, went with uh, women and uh, whatever. I mean, he had, what, what do you have, a toe fetish? Uh, what, what was the deal a, with he it? He had a foot fetish. Yes. That was, that, that's yeah. always embarrassing when that kind of stuff uh, comes out, isn't it? Always embarrassing. But uh, once he lost the weight, he was useless. Tony Sperano, who was a coach briefly with the Miami Dolphins and so... you know, was successful as an offensive line coach in other situations, probably the biggest mistake ever made by a personnel. That's another reason. Uh, was Mike Tannenbaum the GM of the Jets when Sperano was the offensive coordinator? I think so. Here's a guy that would settle for field goals on first and goal from the one. He would say, you know what? What if we blow the snap here? Let's just kick the three points right now. <laughs> Fans in the stands were appalled. Were like, whoa, 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 what is he doing? The field goal team's coming out here. You got to be out of your mind. I mean, nobody settled. For th this was before coaches had a tendency now, maybe an over tendency to uh, go for it on fourth down in, in, in all circumstances. Well, we're uh, on our own nine yard line, fourth and one. Let's just go for it early in the ball game. Holy Brandon Staley, what are we talking about here? And uh, so it, it, this was very uncommon. But uh, Sperano, uh, once he lost the weight, he had won 11 games as a Dolphins coach uh, while he was a fat guy. He starts running stairs in the stadium. He goes on a special diet, became uh, somewhat of a thin guy. He looked more normal, but he couldn't coach anymore. Yep. So I'm taking the fat guy over the guy that's reading and quoting Nietzsche <laughs> every single time. And if you had to uh, do the checkbox thing that they do in the newspapers and say, uh, well, uh, who has the edge here? How giant of an edge is Andy Reid as a head coach over what we've seen from Mike McDaniel so far? Well, and that's the thing is Andy Reid already went through all the stuff that's frustrating me about McDaniel with the Eagles, right? Like the Eagles, they actually went farther than McDaniel's gone, but they would always struggle in an NFC championship. They struggled in that one Super Bowl, and he's done the opposite with the Chiefs. He's learned from those mistakes, and he always finds a way to make the right call, whereas McDaniel, 
as you just alluded to, always finds a way to make the wrong call. Yes. So to me, we're not always on the same side, and I'm not trying to be um, negative about my Dolphins. I just, with the injuries, with the coaching disparity, it it feels like the Chiefs will find a way to not only win but cover to me. All right, so our burial pick of the weekend uh, in the <laughs> AFC Championship games is going to be the Chiefs laying four on a hook exactly. against the Miami Dolphins in total defiance uh, of my uh, grandmother's uh, dying words which were always take the points. Uh, quickly, the other couple of games, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you've got uh, an interesting one. Two and a half, uh, the Browns on the road. They have a great defense. Browns on the road against the Houston Texans, who were kind of a Cinderella story this year. C.J. Stroud looked great yep. in uh, powering. Uh, and Ryan, uh, the Ryan's uh, the uh, new head coach, yep. did, did a terrific job. So uh, the Houston Texans so were uh, one, one of the uh, feel-good stories about the National Football League this season. I mean, uh, who remembers what Bryce Young did? Uh, during uh, his first year, his rookie season, except uh, you kept seeing uh, Blutarski numbers on the board every time you saw a Carolina score. Really? They have zero again? They even went out the door in that fashion there, failing to cover a small point spread. Now, how were they only getting four points in that final game of the season that they played against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers who were fighting for their lives, their playoff lives in that contest? Uh, they ended up winning that game nine to nothing, so uh, not exactly a great distinction for Tampa Bay uh, as they entered the playoffs. But uh uh, Houston at home uh, against uh, the Cleveland Browns. The Browns, a road favorite, laying two and a half points. And you're inclined to believe that they're going to be able to accomplish that, uh, even though they're being quarterbacked by Joe Flacco, who at any time now could blow a gasket and, and revert back being, to being the same Joe Flacco that the Jets kicked out of their offices and said, you know what, Joe? <laughs> You don't have it anymore. We're going to go with Trevor Simeon in this spot. And uh, don't even bother to call her right. Uh, we don't want to hear from you uh, ever again. He goes to Cleveland. Nice story. Feel good story. Kind of like the Tommy DeVito thing was for a brief moment with the New York Giants. Uh, that evaporated, as you predicted, Luby. Uh, does Flacco uh, revert back to being the Joe Flacco that we saw stinking the joint out for the last couple of years and making you think, retire already, Joe. That was a long time ago that you won the Super Bowl. Well, the difference between the DeVito debacle was that was a fun guy carrying a team that had a lot of issues. Flacco's the opposite, right? Like Flacco's a team that has a really good defense front to back, uh, a really good run game, a good offensive line, good skill position talent. And he doesn't have to do all that. So, and he's veteran enough to know, let me not. That's a problem I think with Stroud is he's a talented kid and they actually have a decent team around him for as high as they drafted last year. But it's all been about him, right? C.J. Stroud, C.J. Stroud. To me, this would be the moment where he tries to do too much, and Joe Flacco knows not to do that. And I hate being a, a chalk-eating pig, but yeah. this just feels like – it feels like the Browns to me. It, it feels like the Browns, especially under three. Like the Browns' events and the run game is good enough where I think they'll win and they'll cover. So far, this show ought to be brought to you by Milk of Magnesia. I know. Huh? I, know. I feel like Tom's <laughs> <laughs> Tastes like chalk. <laughs> well, what about Bill's <laughs> – Laying 10 at home to a team that looked inept, the Pittsburgh Steelers, for uh, the latter stages of the season. They did manage to win enough games to make it in the postseason. The other circumstances uh, fell into place so that uh, they found their way uh, into this matchup. They have to go to Buffalo, which uh, if Kansas City is going to be negative eight, what's it going to be like in Buffalo? <laughs> How is Buffalo going to be the uh, sunny, that. warm confines? <laughs> what the fuck is going on? Why is it minus eight in Kansas City? That, that's that's a tough thing to try to comprehend. I, I mean, what are we talking about? Green Bay, Wisconsin? These brave young men here to play a child's game. The frozen tundra. Um, I, I don't know what to do in that ball game. I'm not sure. I, I don't know that I want to go out on a, a ledge here, and I certainly don't want to jump off uh, the Acapulco Cliffs uh, while backing the Buffalo Bills. But um, I, I would be – I hate to say it. I, I guess a 10 in a playoff game, can uh, Mike Tomlin motivate his team without T.J. Watt? That, that's another huge factor in that game. Can he motivate the Pittsburgh Steelers behind Mason Rudolph to be within 10 – of the Buffalo Bills, who are so error-prone that, that you thought that they were going to work their way right into a situation where it was Buffalo going to Kansas City, where they would be far more uh, capable of adapting to the uh, ridiculous uh, conditions that this game is going to be played under in KC. And uh, you, you, you uh, would have had the uh, Buffalo Bills coming right back here had they lost that game against the Miami Dolphins for a rematch. Uh, can, can, they, can they go ahead and beat the Pittsburgh Steelers and spank them to the tune? Of ten or more points. Well, and what's the what's interesting, and it, it should be annoying to Bills fans, but I think they just love Josh Allen wholeheartedly that they accept him unconditionally. But when he has a game like he just had versus the Dolphins, I feel like the next game he doesn't do that, 
And I think that's the thing that'll save the Bills in this game with no <laughs> with uh, no quarterback to speak of. Mason Rudolph was on the trash heap. Um, TJ Watts, the leader of that defense, he's not there. All but Josh Allen has to do is not screw up. And to me, I think where he was trying to prove something versus Dolphins, I don't think he has to prove do that versus Steelers. I think he's going to be smart this game. And I think because of that, you'll see the Bills win. It's going to be a tough game because the Bills don't, don't their offense has been ick, but they have enough. And I think the Bills will, I just, that 10 is so weird. I don't like the 10. I just, I can't see doing anything with the Steelers. Like, yeah. even, like I just can't. How compromised will Josh Allen be though when, when he has to remove Chris Collinsworth uh, <laughs> lips from a certain appendage? There's a guy that's throwing two hideous picks, uh, dropped a ball and, and uh, you know, given it away when they were in a uh, position to score, threw a ball short of the uh, goal line with no time left in the first half, cost his team a minimum of 12 points and maybe more. And Collinsworth is talking about him like he's a second coming to John Elway. In fact, he even referenced Elway yes, as if yes. he was orchestrating the drive. Yep. And then against a very compromised Miami Dolphins defense, uh, Josh Allen uh, manages to uh, execute one good drive in the game. And uh, essentially, that whole game hinged on a, a bozoic special teams play by the Miami Dolphins, who, who gave up the punt return for the touchdown, 96 yards. Uh, can you trust the Buffalo Bills and Josh Allen to uh, not be as error-prone as they've been? I'm not sure. So the 10 points uh, looks prohibitive there. So so we're not going to line up in this uh Position where, where we're taking all three favorites. Luby, we, we should lose this job. Joe Manuel, we, we apologize. <laughs> we talked with the lovely Leslie. And by the way, Leslie, uh, you were right. Uh, the camera was on a tilt. <laughs> and there's no more untrustworthy person on earth. I am sorry, people. I apologize. You can have a guy whose eyeballs look kaleidoscopic, who is frothing at the mouth, who is talking to himself uh, as if he had some form of Tourette's and uh, making uh, animal sounds uh, in between every sentence that he speaks. But the most untrustworthy people in the world are the people with the tilted head. <laughs> you ever notice that, Luby? They're unscrupulous. <laughs> Maybe that's why the head is on a tilt. So I apologize for coming to you in that fashion since I laid a little location move in the uh, broadcast site here. Uh, but we finally get... I, I thought my floor was uh, not level. No. I was ready to sue the builder of this place. <laughs> But yeah, but I'm those... going all chalk. I think the Bills will find a way to cover the 10. Uh, I presume next week I may be more open-minded with my picks. I just th – this weekend's really tough. The way the weather's factoring in, the way the injuries are involved, it's hard for me to go with any of the dogs. In the AFC, now we'll do the NFC tomorrow. When we talk NFC, maybe I'll be – it'll be a little different. Just right now with the AFC, it feels like it's going to go to form. So that's brilliant, uh, our analysis of the game. <laughs> we got you taking the cheese because uh, it's always better to bet on a fat man. Than it is over the intellectual. We have uh, Joe Flacco uh, guiding a road victory after he was uh, pretty much out of football and, uh, uh, you know, may not have been any more effective than Frank Ryan was if he was coming back from the grave to quarterback this team. And uh, then we're going to go ahead and lay 10 with the error prone Buffalo Bills who were life and death to get into the postseason in this position and host a uh, home game for uh, the opening round of the playoffs. So when it looked like they were dead in the water, Four games back, when they were sitting there, uh, you do the math on that. Uh, where'd they end up? 11 and 6. So uh, they, they were sitting there at 7 and 6 just a few weeks ago and uh, managed to uh, get by a bunch of really schlepper teams, a bunch of NFL bag ladies, including a, a badly depleted Miami Dolphin team that uh, they were life and death to beat. And we're going to lay 10 points with that club against yes. the Pittsburgh Steelers, all because of TJ1. <laughs> People, I would suggest you buy uh, some kind of handicapping sheet here. Maybe look at the gold <laughs> sheet. Because <laughs> obviously that hospital stay did something to my brain. All right, we have to get out of here. Thanks so much for tuning in. That's the morning briefing for today. I'm Jeff DeForest from Mike Luby Lubitz. Once again, great to be back with you guys. Uh, nothing worse than being at the Hotel California, which is any hospital in America. You can check in, but unless you go out in a bag that's zipped up, it's very hard to check out. So uh, we'll see you next time, uh, next edition of the Morning Briefing. From Mike Luby Lubitz, I'm Jeff DeForest. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time as uh, we uh, leave you with three chalk-eating dogs <laughs> in the opening round of the AFC playoffs.